to the paper. Good afternoon and a warm greetings. I welcome you all to the FACO Masters class series, a series of seven lectures, a sponsored series by Johnson & Johnson Mission. I am Dr. Lionel Raj, Medical Director and Academic Head of the Tragarwal Sai Hospitals in Tirunal Valley, South India. It's indeed a great honor and pleasure to me to introduce a well-renowned person, Dr. Mohan Rajan, sir, who doesn't require any int introduction to most of us as he is well known everywhere in the, in the globe. He is the chairman and director of Rajan Eye Care Hospital in Chennai, in Tamil Nadu. He is the president-elect of uh, Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association, visiting professor in Savita Medical College. He is a past president of Intraocular Implant and Refractive Society of India, an alumni of Shankarnetralaya, member of Managing Council, All India Ophthalmological Society, and member scientific committee of the AOS. He is also a chairman of Eye Care of Rotary District 3232. Professor Dr. Mohan Rajan is proficient in both anterior and posterior segment surgeries. He has presented more than 2,000 papers nationally and overseas in all the renowned congresses. He has performed more than 120 live surgeries micro-incision cataract surgeries across the world, has several innovations to his credit, like puncture excess, Mohan Rajan's chopper, etc. He has delivered 25 named orations and had published more than 42 publications in various peer-reviewed journals. And he is also a reviewer of most of the peer-reviewed journals. He has won several best video awards from American Academy, Asia Pacific Academy, American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons, European Society for Cataract and Refractive Surgery, APAO, World Ophthalmology Congress, etc. He has trained and mentored over 600 ophthalmologists around the globe. He is also the winner of 55 Ophthalmic Premier League till date. It's a world record, in fact. So, with this introduction, uh, he has also anchored four books. Uh, he has uh, been authored. He has authored four books. And with this introduction, in a cataract surgery, as we know, FACO or microfaco emulsification are technologies which has evolved over several decades. Likewise, there was an evolution and still developments in the field of OVD. Laterally, an integral part of successful cataract procedure is the implantation of an intraocular lens. The choice of lens, the preferred way of uh, implantation, the preferred implantation sites like in the back, over the sulcus, anterior chamber, back to the sclera, suture to iris or sclera, clip to iris, etc., etc., etc. All those are most important, just like the matter of pacomelsification itself. To talk on eye oil implantation techniques, I invite Dr. Mohan Rajan, sir, whose experience with over 150,000 cataract procedures would justify him to be the right speaker on this subject. Over to you, sir. Shall I share my screen, Lionel? Yes, sir, please. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. We are we are very well able to see your screen. Okay. First of all, let me thank Lionel, my very good friend. I'm uh, really impressed by Lionel's growth. And you know, Lionel is one of the top guys, very, very innovative and a very good surgeon. He's doing fantastically well in Thinal Valley in the Agarwal Hospital. I'm very glad that he was, we, uh, he's moderating this session. Lionel, thank you very much. Also, also like to thank the j, j team for this wonderful opportunity. I would say this has been a real experience and learning for me as well as for the delegates who are participating in this webinar, which is called the FACO Masterclass Series. <clears throat> as you all know, uh, these are my financial letters, which has nothing to do with this particular uh, lecture. We had the uh, 
the five FACO masterclass series, that is know your FACO mission, the wound construction, capsular excess and hydro dissection or hydro procedures, the nucleus management, epinucleus and cortical aspiration. Eyewall implantation techniques is what we are going to do in the sixth one. And we have got one more next week, which is going to be the seventh one. The topic will be decided in a couple of days. Each and every of these are very, very important. The knowing your FACO mission, we talked about the various FACO dynamics, the various FACO missions, the wound construction, of course, is very, very important as far as the FACO emulsification is concerned. This is the safety valve. Capsular excess, nobody can emphasize the importance of the capsular excess and the hydro procedures. And the nucleus management, we did the divide and conquer, the stop and chop, and the direct chop, the vertical chop, the horizontal chop. All these we discussed a couple of weeks back. And of course, last week, we discussed a very important topic, which is the epinucleus and cortical aspiration. And today, we are going to do the final one, which is the IOL implantation, as far as the FACO emulsification is concerned. And next week, probably we'll look at the advanced FACO like complications or management of the complications or how to anticipate the complications. The IOL implantation is very, very important for all of us because we have to make sure the IOL is in the bag. And after having done so much of work, like all this, the previous, like uh, the uh, procedures, the nucleus management, the cortical aspiration, it is ultimately very important. The crucial step is the IOA, putting the right IOA in the right place. And that is what is important. And that is what we are going to talk in the next few minutes in this webinar. Okay, now look at the IOA implant. If you look at the IOA implantation, normally we have a single piece lens, which is in the bag foldable lens, which is a common scenario today after a micro incision cataract surgery. And then of course, <coughs> we have a three-piece <coughs> three IOL. Then we have a three-piece uh, IOL that is a sulcus fixation. Then you have an AC IOL or an anterior chamber angle supported IOL. Then iris fixation IOL, which is a retro fixation. Skirial fixation, either sutured or a glued IOL or the Yamane technique, whatever it is. All these I'm going to cover in this particular lecture. Now look at this thickness multifocal, okay? When you, I'm going to start this thickness multifocal just to show you that the most important thing for an IOL is to, I'll stop here just to show you this. Okay, I'm going to stop here, okay? When you have a multifocal lens, please understand, don't try to catch the optic of the lens. For example, any lens for that matter, more so in a multifocal lens because these have got diffractive rings. The technus multifocal has got the diffractive rings on the posterior surface. The, re <coughs> the restore has got on the anterior anti surface. And it's very important that you don't hold the optic of the lens and damage the optic of the lens, which is very, very important with the McPherson. Always hold the aptic of the lens, which is what I have shown you. And also you should know that before injecting the lens, inflate the bag with a nice viscoelastic, preferably viscoelastic like here long cohesive viscoelastic. Or if you have got access only to HPMC, HPMC is good enough. Only thing is it takes a longer time for the HPMC to come out of the eye. The here long comes out of the eye very quickly. So some people do the irrigation assisted uh, what you call the lens implantation. I will also talk about that. I don't do that. I always use, uh, use a viscoelastic, like a cohesive viscoelastic. Inflate the bag. Use the right injector for the right lens, the appropriate injector. Don't use some other company injector for some other lens. Very important. Don't use the Technus Platinum injector for the Alcon lens, or the Alcon Monarch cartridge or the injector for the Technus lens or whatever it is. Don't interchange that or don't mix it because that is going to end up in trouble. And all these are very, very important because after having done so much of good work, and if you don't put the lens properly, ultimately the patient has come only for the intraocular lens and gaining the vision as well. You can see how I'm loading the lens. I'm not, try, I'm not 
holding the optic of the lens at all. I'm always making sure that I don't this thing, and then and then I gently press the lens, and then center of the lens, and then fold the cartridge inside. This is a platinum injector, <clears throat> which goes through a 2.2 millimeter or a 2.4 millimeter incision as well, making sure this is a screw type injector. I always prefer a screw type injector than the push type injector for many reasons. Because in push type injector, you don't have proper what you call the uh, uh, the force or the proper control. You can see how the lens is going beautifully into the thing, making sure that the leading haptic goes. Underneath the the rexus margin, that's very important. And then slowly unfolds. Don't try to withdraw the cartridge at this time. Try to go to this thing and inject the viscoelastic, and can put the uh, or you can just dial the trailing haptic also into that. You can see the thickness multifocal. Look at the Purkinje images right in the center. You can see the central ring. The Purkinje images are there, and that is an indication the centration is also very good. All patients, all the cases, go in. And I'm going to show that also. Go in and remove the viscoelastic from behind the lens, which is in viscoelastic in the anterior chamber behind the lens from the angles also. You can see another patient. You can see here, iTech, which is a lens of choice for me today because it's a preloaded lens. This is a beautiful lens made by again the J and J. <clears throat> this is a preloaded lens. You can see here. I'm injecting. the bss into the nozzle of the lens and then there is a small something like a stopper which we inject viscoelastic into that and once we remove the stopper you can see here that's a stopper and uh, once you remove that nozzle there then you lock it you lock it into the black line and and then uh, this is a very very simple method what is important is don't try to bypass any step that is what is important don't try to go from step 1 to step 2 3 go from step 1 to step 2 and then step 3 and this also goes through a 2.2 this is a rotatable or the screwing type of injector and you can see here how the lens goes inside the leading haptic is folded and goes underneath the rexus margin and then you can see that i am not trying to withdraw that if you try to withdraw that there's a possibility of the lens getting caught in the incision size <clears throat> always make sure that you stay there and make sometimes you can put it in one stroke like that or you can just wait there and come out and then fish uh, fill in the viscoelastic and then use a second instrument or some dialer just to dial or push it back into the bag the, the leading the trailing optic also goes into the thing so it's a very 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 simple method very simple only thing is it it, it, it needs a little bit of patience again you can see a symphony lens going through a platinum injector and how the symphony lens as you know is an extended depth of vision lens the lens of choice for me nowadays for the presbyopia we are correcting lenses <clears throat> and you can see the rings are about nine rings and compared to the technis multifocal the symphony is only nine rings are there and this gives an extended depth of vision lens again making sure that you go and remove the viscoelastic just to show you a young girl with a posterior polar cataract and trying to remove i did a femto for her doesn't matter whatever surgery you are doing that's a different issue i'm trying to remove the plaque which is there on the uh, posterior capsule i'm using a bimanual method and then i'm trying to remove the uh, plaque you can see that i'm doing that um, plaque removal from the posterior capsule without damaging the posterior capsule without producing a posterior capsule rupture and then going ahead and putting a viscoelastic and putting a symphony lens into the bag again the same method making sure that you are very very gentle making sure that the anterior chamber is filled uh, the bag is filled up the anterior chamber is quite tight and when you inject these lenses and then you can see here the reflexes the purkinje images right in the center of the ring that shows the centering normally the bag centers the the lens centers in the bag but how were if you see that the purkinje images are one side it means that that the lens either one of the haptics is in the sulcus or the lens is not centered well or there is or there is a zoned dialysis or probably you have left lot of viscoelastic into the uh, in the in the posterior uh, that is behind the lens as well again a technis multifocal lens implant just to show you 
how to put the multifocal lens implant, the foldable lens. These are all lenses which fold very, very slowly. There is a controlled unfolding of the lens. You can see how this beautifully, if you keep on seeing this, it's so very, very easy. Now coming to the toric lenses. <clears throat> the toric lenses is slightly different ball game. And we're talking about the toric lenses. You can see this is a thickness toric lens. I'm putting this, I have marked it. So this is a marker, um, 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 marking system. I marked it pre -op. You can see the 0, 180. I marked also the, uh, what do you call, the axis of the incision and uh, the axis of the location here. And I'm trying to rotate this lens uh, uh, to the axis. Always rotation to be done the clockwise in a toric lens and not anti-clockwise. And clockwise, you rotate, that is from the left to the right. That is the clockwise rotation. Because when you rotate anti-clockwise, there's a possibility of the zonal dialysis. You can see how I'm doing the dialysis. Always look for the line. To eliminate the parallax, always look for the reflex, which is there's the center. The reflex coincides with the, with the, with the line also. Then we, in the center, the, see the reflex, the two reflexes come together. It means that, that you are almost on the, on, the, on the center, that is in the axis of the uh, incision. So this is also another way of doing it. So this is the uh, toric axis of the axis, the intended axis of location of the lens. Just to show you an IQ toric, wherein I'm using a markerless system, that is the Callisto system. Tor loading of these lenses is very, very important. Okay, either you load it or you ask one of your trusted uh, assistants who is loading it regularly for you. Make sure because the loading can screw up the whole thing. If you don't load it properly, just to show you how to just fill up with the viscoelastic, first balance on the viscoelastic, I prefer something like a coercive viscoelastic, like Helong. You can use HPMC also. You can see there's a callisto is on. You can see that it's a markerless system which is attached to the Zeiss and IOL master. And the Virion is attached to the lens star and the any other microscope for that, um, uh, for that matter. You can see that when I'm loading the lens, putting the lens, you can see here I'm folding that the leading um, um, the optic, the haptic, and then holding the trailing haptic also and putting it on the surface of the optic, on the surface. You can see that's on the top of the optic and then pushing it inside. And there's a beautiful system that is the Monarch uh, cartridge, the D cartridge, which is very, very, which goes through again a 2.2 smaller incision as well. <clears throat> and making sure that the lens comes in the nozzle after you lock it there and, uh, and making sure that the, the plunger pushes the lens into the nozzle. So this is all, all things, all things you have to do it outside. That is before you enter the eye, you can see the callisto marking is there. And now I'm going to put the lens inside and we were talking about the toric lens implantation. Very important. Again, the, the chamber has to be filled up with a good uh, viscoelastic, preferably heal on a cohesive viscoelastic. And then you can see that the axis of the location is about four degree in this particular patient. You can see the zero 180 degree is marked in the yellow, uh, zero and the, and the four degree is marked in the three blue lines, which is there in the callisto. So what we have to do is you have to center that ring or the, 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 the toric mark onto the center of the three, the, the, the three blue lines. Again, going underneath, removing the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber angle, more importantly, underneath the lens as also, tapping the lens as far back as possible. You can see I'm trying to uh, uh, I rotate the lens uh, first uh, clockwise, which I have not shown this. And then I try to make sure that the three dots are coinciding with the center of the blue, which is again, very, very important for you to understand that is the end point as far as seeing. And always hydrate the wounds very nicely. And if you are not able to have a deep chamber, make sure that you put a suture in the case of toric lenses as well. Again, crystal lenses, you can see here the loading of the crystal lens. The crystal lens is different because these lenses are silicon lenses, a little slippery as well. They've got a slightly bigger uh, polyamide haptics and haptics are a little peculiar shape. And sometimes it may have difficulty in going through the uh, uh, what do you call the, the, the leading haptic going through the, uh, what do you call the rixis margin. I always, when, I, when I'm doing the uh, trailing haptic, I always flex it up nicely. 
you have to make sure that you flex it up nicely because if it goes into the sulcus you are in trouble very difficult to retrieve these lenses from the sulcus <clears throat> these crystal lenses always making sure that you have a slightly larger rexis like 5.5 or 5.75 mm and these crystal lenses are working very well as far as accommodative lenses are concerned if this is an ultra set lens which is a preloaded lens made by the alcon company you can see here how it is uh, being loaded and there are uh, this is a very uh, very good system and there is a depth guard nozzle there is also a plunger lock and also uh, 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 tension glide and also a, a handle which is like a tension glide plunger and then then you have the lens stop which is all the inherent features of this ultra set iol which is a preloaded lenses the iq lenses of the alcon you can see here again i'm loading it all these protocols you need to know it very very nicely this is something like a wound assisted you go through and this uh, uh, the uh, the depth guard nozzle prevents the distortion of the wound and you can see how the lens goes beautifully into the bag without any problem again the envista lenses which is made by the bosch and lom again hydrophobic lenses the glistening free lenses these are lenses are little uh, what do you call little more uh, what do you call uh, rigid and also it takes a longer time for unfolding and this is the way i load the lenses and you can see how the lenses go inside the eye and in the case of presence of pcr this is probably a lens of choice because the controlled unfolding of the lenses the slow unfolding of the lenses make sure the pcr doesn't enlarge especially when you want to put a lens small pcr when you want to put a lens in the bag and it's probably a lens of choice for me and you can see this is the lens invista lenses which are very good lenses and hydrophobic lenses which have got excellent contrast sensitivity they are glistening free lenses and you can see that the lenses have got a very good uh, <coughs> uh, uh, what do you call uh, ab value and the contrast sensitivity is also very good the pco is also very very less with the lenses again the mi60 lenses which is wound assisted 1.8 we used to be use a lot of these lenses these are hydrophilic lenses which go through a small incision the wound assisted lenses we have to just use the push type you have to be a little, little careful make sure that you you uh, inflate the anterior chamber the anterior chamber is a little less with it is not inflated properly there is a possibility that the lens can buckle and get caught in the wound which which can happen again the suprafobe in focus which is an extended depth of lens uh, uh, lens uh, uh, made by the apasami group you can see this uh, 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 how i load that lens into the into the uh, injector which is being provided by the company more importantly you can see here how the lens goes inside beautifully into the rexis margin and centers very well there is a central ring which is about 1.4 mm in these lenses which makes uh, the gives the extended depth of vision in these lenses again you can see the suprafob in focus lens how i am trying to do it in one stroke you can see many of these lenses you can just put it in one stroke you can just put it like that and can uh, making sure that you don't enjoy uh, uh, withdraw the uh, this is a supra not in focus lens is a very plain suprafob lens just to show you the three piece lenses the rezoom lenses we don't have this rezoom lenses we have the sensor acrylic lenses which is the rezoom lenses we used to use this rezoom which is refractive hydrophobic multifocal refractive with the five zone refractive you can see how these lenses are being loaded the loading of this three piece i just to show you how the loading of the three piece lenses are very very important when you load the three piece lenses one of the haptics has to come out and you have to see you can see here how i'm trying putting that the haptic which is the trailing haptic has to jut out and you can see this uh, injector which is being provided at that time for the re re rezoom lenses which similar to the platinum injector what we are using and uh, which can go through uh, a smaller incision as well so again a rezoom lens you can see here how oh, this is a older video so the, the clarity may not be as good please understand when you put a three piece lens these lenses unless you got a good nice bag because these lenses will rotate and come like this and they can come from the right to the left that there is the leading haptic and sometimes if your bag is not inflated properly you can go and touch the posterior capsule and rupture the posterior capsule as well so just to show you an ma60 three piece lens again how i am trying to put this a patient who had a high myopia and you can see here this is an ma60 lens again going through a <clears throat> c cartridge there which is made with monarch c cartridge you can see here how the lens 
the leading haptic or uh, the, the, the haptic comes and rotates and unless your the bag is inflated very nicely there's a possibility that you can rupture because this can go and rupture the pc and that is the reason why you always you have to inflate the bag very nicely before you implant okay you can see here how i'm tucking the lens the trailing haptic into the bag and the patient becomes all right in the case of a small pupil it is always very very difficult to know exactly where you whether whether your leading haptic is going inside or not again good viscoelastic quasi viscoelastic like helon or a uh, helon gv or something like that and then you can see here how i'm trying to push that lens into the sink and also uh, going all the way inside going all the way inside making sure that most of the optic as well as the leading haptic also goes inside and then it's be very easy to put the trailing haptic also when you have a small rexis always very difficult to push a, a lens which is about uh, this size about 6 mm diameter and this is a patient who had a small rexis a mature cataract i had to do a small rexis <coughs> i didn't want to enlarge the rexis before the implantation of the lens so i thought i will try to push the lens you can see here the lens is going all the way inside and you can see here how it is very easy once you do that then you can probably remove the viscoelastic from behind and enlarge the rexis and becomes very easy viscoelastic removal under the eye oil you can see this is very very important okay going under the because this tapping of the lens will not remove the viscoelastic going under the that's why when you use a quasi viscoelastic like helon just going underneath the lens in one stroke the entire helon will come out of the eye and it will make life easy for you when you have a pcr when you have special situations then you have an eye oil in the bag the eye oil in the sulcus or an ac eye oil iris claw lens sf eye oil yamane technique or a glued eye oil so this is a pcr you can see this pcr occurred to me long time back about 20 years back you can see the small pcr but once you have a pcr don't withdraw this uh, this thing always inject viscoelastic in through a side port but that is all this thing uh, everybody knows about that but more importantly you can see here how i am trying to uh, uh, yeah put this lens uh, after doing a small vitrectomy and put this in this is an ma60 lens which was available at that time and i'm trying to put this in the bag i'm using the holder and folder method of the at that time because the injectors were not available again is another patient with the pcr you can see here the pcr i'm i'm uh, uh, once you have pcr don't try to withdraw this instrument out of the eye It's again very very important and then you do a bimanual vitrectomy you always do remove the vitreous and then remove the cortex and then in this patient i put a sensor acrylic lens again this patient was done long time back in the year 2007 you can see the uh, date also and uh, how this uh, sensor acrylic lenses which is a three piece lens once you have pcr and you have, and you have uh, lost most of the posterior capsule there is no point in putting a single piece lens into the bag because it is going to produce ugs syndrome because of the thick haptics always put a multi piece lens in the sulcus and you can capture this lens into the bag as well you can see here i am trying to do an anterior vitrectomy and at that time the 23 gauge was not available to us and it's only the 20 gauge anterior vitrectomy i can see how i'm trying to put this lens once you know exactly because sometimes the pupil can become small you can use an iris hooks to find out where exactly your rexis margin is but you can also go by uh, your by your experience in the sense that so always making sure that the leading haptic goes underneath the iris always touch the iris very important then what i do is i put the trailing haptic also making sure that it goes underneath the iris and not and making sure that i then that then i retract the iris and see to make sure that the lens is well placed on the rexis margin and do a tap test if you do a tap test to find out the whether the lens is going to be steady or not but more importantly i would suggest that when you have a pcr what happens is the pupil becomes small and that is the reason you can see this is a post operative patient of this particular patient and pupil becomes small always use iris hooks this patient wanted a toric lens and uh, <clears throat> actually a gynecologist from uh, uh, from uh, from kerala i can see her and she had a very very hard nucleus and uh, the toric lens already the lens started sinking into the anterior into the posterior uh, 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 that is uh, the chamber and the vitreous cavity as well 
I did the, what is called an anterior assisted levitation of the lens and they extended the incision and brought it out. More importantly, I did an anterior vitrectomy and, and, and then they removed the cortex as well and by using a bimanual technique that is using a separate anterior chamber maintainer and then I put a <coughs> multi-piece lens in the sulcus. You can see the rexus margin is quite intact with this and no point in putting a single piece lens, always put a multi-piece lens. You can see a multi-piece lens, always making sure that you do, the, the leading haptic goes underneath the iris in front of the rexus margin, not underneath the uh, cap, uh, capsular rexus margin. If it goes underneath the capsular rexus margin, there's a possibility the lens can <coughs> go into the vitreous cavity the very next day and you can be shocked to see very next day the lens will be on the macula. Just to show you a posterior polar cataract, a posterior polar cataract, how we manage, more importantly, just to show you the IOL implantation. Again, I'm putting a multi-piece lens, in this case, an MA60 Alcon lens, and you can see here how I'm trying to put that leading haptic on this surface. Sometimes you can put it in the anterior chamber also, but more importantly, to make sure that the leading haptic tucks or what you call, uh, 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 goes underneath or underneath the iris on the surface of the anterior capsule, and then I'm tucking the, uh, the, the what you call the trailing happy with the McPherson forceps. I'm not leaving it, leaving it in the sulcus. I'm doing what is called the optic capture. You can see that I'm the the haptic is in the sulcus. The optic capture. The rexus is intact. You can see the posterior capsule. There are two pillars on the posterior capsule. We very typical of the posterior polar cataract. I'm doing what is called the optic capture, wherein <clears throat> you can see here uh, how I am trying to uh, capture that optic into the capsular rexus margin. And this is again can just to show you how this optic capture is done and how this very, very easy technique, you can just take a, something like a Kuglan hook or a second instrument and try to capture that lens into the optic. You can see here again, the, the end point of the optic capture, look for the ovalization of the anterior capsular margin. You can see here, this is the optic, which is there again, another patient with the posterior polar cataract. And I'm trying to do the optic. So don't leave the lenses in the sulcus. If you have a rexus, which is intact, always making sure that you capture it because you can prevent the UGH syndrome and maintain long-term centration of the lens. You can see here, the ovalization of the anterior capsule is the end point for you. This lens will not move a micron and this lens will be long-term. Centration of the lens will be there. Stability of the lens will be there. And more importantly, because the lens is actually in the bag, the haptic alone is in the sulcus. The lens is actually slightly posterior. Optic is slightly posterior as if it is in the bag. It would, uh, there's no question of any UGH syndrome or any pigment release for that matter. This is a patient, uh, same patient, two months, four months, one year. You can see the maintenance of visual acuity. More importantly, centration of the lens. Again, very, very important when you do an haptic capture. So don't leave these multi-piece lenses in the sulcus, especially in high myopia, there's a possibility of long-term centration. And also in other patients as well, there's a possibility of UGH syndrome because it can rub on the iris. Again, to show you that the, 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 the uh, patient, uh, again, with a with small PCR, you can see here the PCR is there and there's a small PCR there. But what I'm trying to do is I'm immediately converting to a bimanual technique and injecting viscoelastic and coming out of the eye and trying to put viscoat there. And when you put viscoat there, the dispersive viscoelastic, uh, and you can see here, uh, or you can have a soft shell technique as well, putting viscoat and heel on also, and making sure you can see that small tear there. And then I went ahead and put a lens, a single piece lens in the bag, a single piece lens in the bag, making sure that you don't do too much of maneuver in the posterior uh, in the in the in the anterior chamber or in the posterior chamber and while putting the lens because sometimes when you're putting the lens because you're not converted this tear into a posterior capsular excess there can be a possibility of a excess uh, extension you can see that uh, tear is slightly extended when i when i try to pull the put the lens and this is again very very dangerous just to show you that another patient who had a small pc tear this pc tear is here right here you can see here i'm injecting viscoelastic and this is when you have a small PC tear, as I told you, the lens of my choice will be something like Envista or 
uh, even uh, thickness lens also. But more importantly, this Envista, what happens is it unfolds very slowly, but it is a little more rigid than the thickness or the SA60, but it uh, unfolds very slowly. You can see here, and just putting the lens in the bag and going ahead, and the patient had fairly good results as well. Again, another patient you can see a biomanual IA. There is a, a, a there's a PC tear. You can see the PC tear. I'm injecting viscoelastic, and again, I'm putting the multi-piece lens. Once I'm putting the multi-piece lens, uh, in this case, I'm putting a multi-piece lens. You can see here, I'm putting a sensor acrylic lens, which is going right in front of the excess margin underneath the iris, and I'm tucking the trailing aptic. I'm not leaving that then the sulcus there. I'm trying to capture that very nicely into the excess margin, that, that, thus ensuring very nicely. Again, if you want to add on lenses, for example, the Sulcoflex lenses, which is made by a company called Rena and Sulcoflex lenses, either if you have, you have got a residual power or the residual astigmatism, you can have toric lenses or the patient wants a patient who are having pseudophakia with a monofocal lens, they want multifocality, you can put a multifocal lens. These are all the Sulcoflex lenses, which have got a larger diameter, which has got undulations on the surface of the uh, haptic as well, which can stay in the sulcus without incision. So you can add on these lenses to the regular lenses in the sulcus, and these lenses can stay in the sulcus and produce excellent results to these patients uh, without any problem. Again, to show you, again, uh, just to show you uh, that uh, anterior chamber lenses, I, I'm still using some anterior chamber. The only thing is these are patients who are very old patients for whom I cannot do a second surgery and making sure the cornea is very thin, and always make sure the anterior chamber lenses, sizing of the lens is very important. Again, making sure the pupil is round, there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber. Use tricot to remove the vit all the vitreous preservative free tricot and <clears throat> portion these lenses. Don't forget to do a peripheral hydrectomy in this case. If you do a peripheral hydrectomy, these patients, you can see this patient, particular patient, after one week post op, the cornea is clear, the pupil is round, the chamber. The PI is patent, and also the uh, the uh, the lens is well centered, and the patient had fairly good results. Again, if you have you have lost the entire anterior capsule as well as the posterior capsule, you can use what is called the iris claw lenses. These iris claw lenses are very easy to inject. I always put a scleral incision, and because the uh, the maintenance of the chamber is very very important in the iris claw lenses, uh, or you can even use an anterior chamber maintainer. More importantly, the, the holding of the lenses with something like a claim and forceps, you can use that. But uh, this is a very, very easy technique. You can go through the side port and then with a 26 gauge needle, you can just try to enclavate that claw into the, into the mid peripheral iris. And uh, you can see that mark on that. And once it's, uh, it's fixed on one side, you can enclavate the other claw also. And it makes life easy. This retro iris claw lenses is a very, very quick method of rehabilitation of aphakia, or if you have a PCR, you can do that as well. Scleral fixated eye oil, you have sutured eye oils, special eye oil with eyelets, special sutures, tough learning curve, cumbersome procedure, less stability, more pseudophacodonesis, increased incidence of secondary glaucoma, evade CME, suture degradation can occur, and the lenses can dislocate after a long time after maybe a few years or so, dislocation of IOL can also occur. So this is the Abexterno technique, 9-0 proline, 27, I used to use 10-0 proline, but nowadays I'm using more of the, uh, what do you call, the uh, glued IOL and keep uh, technique standardized. Just make about, <clears throat> about two millimeter behind the limbus, make a small groove and introduce a 26 gauge or the, the, the I'm sorry, the 9-0 proline, Long needle, you can see that, and you can see a 26 gauge needle going through a scleral uh, po uh, pocket incision, and then there is an eyelet. These are a special uh, uh, lenses which has got a small eyelet on the optic and the, and, the, and the haptic, and these are lenses which are suitable for this sutured scleral fixation. Then you have to go in and uh, uh, retrieve that uh, needle again through that groove. And once you do that on one side, you can do it on the other side also, and you try, try to put these lenses uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the posterior chamber and try to uh, put a knot there and try to uh, make sure that you bury the knot in the, 
crevices of the scleral groove and so that the knot is not getting exposed. You can see here, I'm doing the same thing on the other side as well. And you can uh, make it, making sure that on one side, you put the uh, suture from up down, and the other side to uh, put the suture from down up. So that is again, very important to prevent the torquing of the lenses. More importantly, the torquing of the lenses are very, very uh, uh, not uh, uncommon in these type of lenses. And that's the reason why pseudophacotinesis and also the suture degradation nowadays, we can even use Gore-Tex sutures for this. Glued eyewear, as you know, Amar is the one who started this way back in 2007. Very, very simple technique. We have done uh, more than 700, 800 of these uh, glued eyewells, plenty of them, and with excellent results. More the 0, 180 degree, the flaps have to be made. You can use a Ashin Agarwal marker or radial cartotomy marker to mark the 0, 180 degree. Again, this glued eyewell, you can see here uh, how this. Uh, um, um, uh, the, the, uh, you can have a rectangular flap or you can have a triangular flap or whatever you're um, uh, comfortable with, which is about two millimeter from the limbus, 1.5 to two millimeter from the limbus. You can see here, I'm doing a flap and then you can have an anterior chamber maintainer or a pass planar infusion because <clears throat> sometimes I use, most of the times I use pass planar infusion because I do both anterior and posterior segment surgery. But many anterior segment surgeons will not be able to use the pass planar infusion so they can go ahead with the anterior chamber maintainer and then you can go ahead and do what is called you can ask your assistant to push the lens and this is a screw type i use the sensor acrylic lenses or the ma60 lenses i prefer the sensor acrylic lenses for the glued eye well simple technique only thing is when you when the when the haptic comes out don't try to pull it out always catch the tip of the haptic and once the optic comes out then you bring it out, externalize the haptic on one side, and then the handshake technique, you externalize the haptic on the other side as well, and then try to tuck the haptic into the grooves. You can see here, uh, the, uh, into the small tunnels, which you're making with the 26 gauge needle. Uh, always, uh, 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 what do you call, mark that with the, the, the gentian blue, uh, violet, or the, the, the uh, tripan blue, to make sure that I know exactly where my tunnel is, so they can tuck that, haptic into the tunnel, a good amount of the haptic has to go into the tunnel. The advantage of the glued eye well is that you can tuck on one side and untuck on the other side to make sure that the lens is very taut and also uh, there is no torque on the lens. Again, very important, there is no pseudophacodonesis which has been done in several studies. The MRI technique, which is a modification of the glued eye well, what you do is you just go inside uh, this uh, uh, needle. I've done a few of these uh, surgeries. You can see here, I'm trying to uh, put this uh, 27 gauge needle and uh, put the haptic into that and trying to externalize the haptic through a small uh, scleral uh, what a tunnel which is made by a 27 uh, gauge needle you can see and trying to externalize that haptic on both sides once you externalize both the haptics then what you do is just do a cautery the cautery is not the same thing they don't, don't touch the, uh, the thick of this is just take the cautery closer to that and then create try to create a flange Try, once you create a flange, you push it under the conjunctiva and then you can see the lens is centered very well. Of course, the Kanabrava technique, uh, my very good friend Sergio Kanabrava from Brazil has given this video to me just to show you a four point fixation of a Kanabrava. You can see a four zero or five zero proline suture, which is used on an Acreos AO lens, which has got a four point fixation. You can see how he does it. And you can see that the only thing is the incision has to be extended a little because these are uh, the six millimeter optic lenses, hydrophilic acrylic lenses. And once you do that, you can see that the, uh, the, lens, the, the sutures are externalized. Once the sutures are externalized, then what you have to do is just put a cautery there and you can, you can create a flange nicely. You can, the, the advantage of this Kanabara technique is that it can be either a two point fixation, but there's a four point fixation with it because there is a four flanges as far as the and the Acreos AO lenses are concerned. You can see here the first and second and the uh, th third and fourth flanges are created very nicely and pushed underneath the conjunctiva and the lens is very, very stable without any problem. Now let's see the IOL related complications. The haptic can get stuck underneath the, these are preloaded lenses. I don't want to mention the lenses. You can see the haptic can get stuck underneath the, uh, the surface of the uh, optic. And this is a very, very difficult scenario. For example, uh, this is very difficult scenario because you have to go underneath the optic 
and try to remove that, uh, try to pull it out. And sometimes the there can be a kissing of the two haptics, which uh, which you might have to do mechanically. You can see here and trying to pull it out, and this takes a sometimes long time. As I told you, the Invista lenses take a longer time to uh, unfold. So this Invista lenses never unfolded, and uh, um, uh, the uh, sometimes you might have to use uh, a little more mechanical force. And this, I did a lot of acrobatics for about five minutes, eight minutes, and ultimately I had to remove the lens. This is again an Invista lens is getting caught. Sometimes uh, you can see the heart can get caught. And you can see this is another patient with a supraphobe lens, uh, which is, uh, you can see as I'm putting, putting the haptic, the haptic gets caught. These are the, the green injectors, the green, the medicinal injectors, the green type of injectors wherein the haptic can get caught. You have to be very careful. Don't try to pull that. Always do what is called the episotomy. Use a leaven blade and try to open up the, uh, the, the cartridge. Once you open up the cartridge, is, uh, the, there is more space for the haptic to be released and slowly you can release that haptic slowly. Because otherwise, if you try to pull it out, the haptic will break and then you have to extend the incision and take this lens out. So once I removed that, I did an ocular episotomy and I call this episotomy. And uh, in fact, Lionel has also got a fantastic video on this. And then I put the, uh, the, the lens in the sink. Again, a preloaded lens. The preloaded lenses, you have to be a little careful because you do not know what's happening inside the lenses. The totally pre-loaded lenses, you do not know because you don't see the lenses. Otherwise, the loading of the lenses, you see the lenses macroscopically as microscopically, and then we know exactly. pre loaded in this patient had a, uh, only the optic came and uh, the haptics were missing completely in this particular patient. Obviously, this lens has to be explanted and had to be replaced. Again, another patient with the a, with a, with a pre-loaded lenses, as I, Putting the lens to my to my shock, you can see here there is a large hole on the optic of the lens. There is a I call it the donut lens. You can see here right in the center. And one of my PGs were asking me, what is this type of lens? I told me it's a special type of lens. It's called a pinhole lens, wherein the, through the pinhole the patient will be able to see better. Obviously, these lenses are all very sync. When you have a preloaded lenses or any lenses for that matter, for example, these are preloaded lenses. You can see here the lens is going in. Along with, with it, the cartridge, the plunger also goes in. The silicon plunger, which is there, also goes in and is very difficult because it's very, very slippery to remove the silicon plunger. I had great difficulty in removing that, but this can happen. So what is I'm going to think important is when it is going, to, when, when, they, when, the, when you try to inject these lenses, when it is very tight, when it is very tight, please do not inject these lenses. Take these lenses out completely and go for another set of lenses, another set of cartridge. So that we see. If it's very tight, there's a possibility there can be crack on the lens and there can be a problem of a haptic fracture or the optic fracture or something like a plunger coming out or the thing. It's very tight, always if there's a lot of resistance. Opacified eye oil, we reported a huge number way back in 2002 of a particular company of hydrophilic lenses, opacified eye oil, wherein the, obviously, this lens has to be removed. Again, this is a patient who had a, be careful, this is a patient who had a posterior capsular dexis, pediatric cataract. When, when you put the lenses, okay, sometimes the lens come, can come out with the jerk. We come out with the jerk, you can see here what is happening. The lens is so much salted. The lens so much salted and went through the small posterior capsular opening into the vitreous cavity and we had to do a vitrectomy and remove this lens as well. Again, this particular case wherein the supraphobe lenses came into the when the supraphobe lenses came into the market, I used the you can see here. Uh, I used the uh, just to show you. Uh, uh, I'll stop here. This supraphobe lenses came into the market. They didn't have an injector, so I used the Alcon injector. The Alcon injector for a supraphobe lens. Don't do that. That in the beginning of the lecture itself, I told you, because don't use one injector or one company injector for another lens. So this is what will happen. You can see here, this is a supraphobe injector. There's no, absolutely no, this thing in uh, whatever I'm do, doing here, but you can see here, the lens is coming out with the jerk. You can see that the lens is coming out with the jerk. And then it produces not only a, this thing, it produces a PCR. 
and the lens started tilting into the vitreous cavity. Then I had to do on what, what is called an anterior assisted levitation and pull this lens up and put it in the sulcus and the patient did very well. The take home messages are load the IOL yourself. Use time tested injector systems. Check the compatibility between the IOL and the injector. Beware of preloaded IOLs. Nowadays, all the companies are going, coming out with the preloaded IOLs. Another one or two years, we're going to go only the preloaded IOLs in our market. Do not be complacent. Normally, you are complacent because at the end of surgery, you have done a small pupil, you have done a heart cataract, you have done a fantastic surgery. So, your concentration is not there as much when you are doing the IOL implantation. But the concentration during the IOL implantation has to be not 100%, but has to be 200%. Thank you again, J and J, for this wonderful opportunity. I'll stop sharing my screen. Stay, stay home, stay safe, and stay healthy. Over to Lionel. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, wonderful presentation and video casing of uh, IOL implantation technique. Almost the uh, entire techniques uh, are being covered. Uh, some of the most important things what you said, uh, uh, I'll just uh, summarize for the benefit of uh, young ophthalmologists who are joined yes. here. Do not touch IOL optics while loading the lens, preferably load by yourself. Use appropriate cartridges and don't interchange company uh, cartridges of different companies that may end up in disaster. Ensure Completeness of viscoelastics being removed, especially from the undersurface, the posteriors of, of the IOL, uh, especially in cases of uh, uh, toric implantation and uh, uh, prosperopia correcting lenses. Do not try to bypass any steps so that complications may ensure. Working the images over the center of the lens, on the center of the lens, will act as a clinical sign of exact centration of the uh, presbyopia correcting lens. Always rotate IOL, C-loop IOLs in a clockwise direction uh, in order to avoid zonular dialysis. Special consideration of three-piece intraocular lenses to be taken, to be used, uh, especially when there is a challenge to the posterior capsule. And that was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful demonstration of the hand rotation of the surgeon. Go into the eye, go into the, uh, uh, under the iris, pronate your hand and leave the uh, haptic, the trailing haptic. That was a wonderful demonstration of placing a three-piece eye oil in the sulcus. And one more video, it was uh, very, very nice, sir, wonderful, because uh, the haptic, the axis of the haptic of a three-piece lens, especially in PCR, should be placed uh, perpendicular to the uh, direction of the rent, or in other words, either a PCR should be converted into a posterior capsular axis, or the haptic should be placed perpendicular to the direction of uh, the PCR. Always visualize the excess margin while placing a lens in the sulcus uh, till you get very well experienced and try to do a tap test, what has been demonstrated by Dr. Mohan Rajan sir. And uh, I will stuck onto the injector. Don't take a risk or a challenge. Remove the injector and the I will out and place a new one. I will stuck to the posterior I will surface. Try to dissect using uh, uh, irrigating, uh, you know, uh, IA Pro or to try to make a, a separation using two instruments with well-formed chamber in order to prevent PC rupture. So all these are uh, take-home points which I could gather. And uh, there are some uh, questions for discussion, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, from the audience. And I have few uh, which is worth uh, discussing also. Yes, sir. So which lens is better according to you? Is it a scleral fixation IOL or an iris claw lenses in case of uh, absence cap absent capsule? The back. I prefer the glued IOL for the simple reason that uh, my my you know our study the glued IOL definitely has got better stability and it is in actually the exactly the same position as a lens in the in the bag lens the glued IOL. 
more importantly the uh, the, uh, the the pseudofecodonesis the incidence of cme is very very less with this glued eye whale but the only thing is there is a learning curve in glued eye whale so <clears throat> yesterday also we were discussing in one of the webinars there is nothing wrong in putting a retro iris claw lenses because it takes a little time whether you are putting retro iris claw lenses or a glued eye whale okay make sure that you remove the vitreous which is there in the anterior chamber very important use a preservative free tricot do a bimanual vitrectomy remove the capsular and cortical remnants everything remove the nucleus all the everything make sure that there is no nucleus in the vitreous cavity all these are very very important before you see suppose you have a pcr and you are not able to decide nothing wrong in postponing the secondary iol implantation to a later date which may be 2 weeks 3 weeks down the line when there can be capsular fibrosis also if the anterior capsule is there then you have time to think then you can plan whether you can go for a iris claw lens or a glued eye whale so, so i we do only the glued eye whales mainly of course we have done some iris claw lenses as well and some of the uh, what you call post graduates who have had pcr we have even suggested anterior chamber lenses for very old patients who are coming from very far off places making sure that all the protocols are followed even in anterior chamber lenses the sizing of the lens the taking care of the pupil the taking care of the vitreous doing a peripheral idectomy all these are very very important uh, i do agree with you also sir um, the question was uh, which one do you choose uh, as of i will or uh, iris claw lenses so both are approved version of lenses it's it's the surgeon's preference that makes uh, the choice but i i i i too do agree with you i would prefer to go for a, a intraoscleral haptic fixation using a glued eye whale technique and i also agree that uh, 10 years back uh, we were doing uh, i was doing uh, aci whale while using aci whale it is to be mandated that uh, the the haptics the four points of the haptics fix on the angles and not on the corneal endothelium as well as uh, not on the surface of iris iris and do a, and do a good pa Uh, to avoid any uh, pupillary block so i think that should answer uh, the first question the second one was uh, what type of foldable eye whale can be implanted in the sulcus in case of a pcr is that only a three piece eye whale three piece eye whale or anything else was uh, the question made and it is very clear yeah uh, 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 and most of the reports have also said that uh single piece eye oil in the sulcus is not safe that can produce, uh, yeah and though though there are some surgeons who say i have put uh, single piece lenses in the sulcus i have got a 10 year follow up okay please understand that these single piece lenses have got thicker haptics okay and they've got a, 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 a what do you call thicker optic as well and there is every time the iris moves forward and backward that is uh, in and out uh, when the pupil moves there can be a pigment release and what we call as the ugs syndrome can definitely be there i have explanted personally uh, my cases itself i have put a long time back single piece lenses uh, i'm talking about 10 12 years back i explanted these lenses uh, the sa60 lenses i put it in the sulcus by mistake and i explanted these lenses because the patient had recurrent uveitis and also glaucoma as well so all these problems can occur and my suggestion is when you have uh, when you have a small pcr convert that into a posterior capsular excess and put a single piece lens whatever you want like a technes or a invista or a alcon sa60 whatever you are comfortable with into the bag okay without trying to convert that into a small posterior capsular excess if you try to put a lens in that will go into expand i showed in one of the videos there fortunately for me the lens was stable okay but the prob possibility is that that you can lens the lo lose the lens into the vitreous cavity within no time so if it is not going to be there suppose your posterior capsule is completely gone and you got only the anterior capsule that is capsular excess margin all round my this thing will be that 
go for only a three piece foldable lens preferably a sensor acrylic or an ma60 lens three piece foldable lens that works wonderfully well only thing is don't leave the lens in the haptic the, the haptic you can leave it in the sulcus try to capture the optic is very very simple technique as i shown you in the video uh, uh, <coughs> i i guess uh, dr sachin would have got the answer so in a pcr go for a three piece lens uh, implantation into the sulcus don't ever use uh, a single piece lens on the sulcus but there are uh, another alternative fixation of single piece lens in pcr where uh, the haptics are still posterior to the capsular margin the anterior capsular excess margin whereas the optic lies over the capsule so that is called as a reverse optic fixation reverse optic and capture. and uh, reverse optic capture and uh, that is a more more a challenging work so uh, as panelists we would uh, also recommend uh, don't try to have a single piece lens on the sulcus i have myself also explanted following post operative pigment storms and iop rise so that is fine and uh, uh, an appreciation from dr pallavi uh, wonderful videos can you please suggest some good instruments for sfi oil and how early can secondary i oil be done after primary fk <coughs> you can take the patient after about 2 weeks or 3 weeks um, because in by 2 weeks what happens is there is a good fibrosis and there's a fusion of the anterior and posterior capsule and uh, you can actually see the uh, the uh, the, uh, the excess margin the capsule much more clear uh, clear clearly and after about 2 weeks you can probably take these patients up and also by the time the inflammation everything will subside to a large extent and if there is a spike in the intraocular pressure which is not uncommon after a complicated uh, surgery now all these can be taken care or sometimes there can be corneal edema that can also clear up after about 2 or 3 weeks you can take the patient up for surgery don't be in a hurry you can always tell the patient you are going to get a lens only thing is i am making sure that you are getting the best lens in the best position that is what the patient most of the patients will agree with that i am sure so that is the way i think we should go about it what is the second question the second question was about uh, which type of foldable lens to be implanted no, in no, the sulcus uh, the first clearly oh, the, the instruments okay how early uh, should secondary i oil and uh, the, the 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 first one is uh, suggest some good instruments for sfi oil sfi oil if you are going for the uh, what do you call the glued i oil then the instruments are available the glued i will force which is all these are available uh, with the epsilon company and uh, that's what i we are using that regularly and you need only the glued i will force apps otherwise it's all very simple and uh, straight forward technique and uh, the, uh, it's not a very uh, what do you call uh, except for the cost of the glue otherwise it's not a you know only thing is you need to use a three piece lens again yeah That's and right. for a, for the sutured scleral fixation you need that particular uh, needle the alcon needle the uh, the uh, 90 proline uh, needle which oh. is there or the 10 i don't use the 10 i would suggest go for the 90 but the 10 sometimes it gets it's, it's a little more fragile fragile it, uh, it cuts so 90 proline is probably the way to go and otherwise the instruments are nothing but you need a only a 26 gauge or a needle on that side and uh, the routine instruments which are there there are no uh, special instruments with that yeah uh, that's a wonderful answer also uh, i think uh, dr purvi uh, uh, would have got the uh, answer no specific or uh, no extra instruments are required but, but for uh, uh, micro surgical forceps which can go through a, a, a small 26 uh, gauge opening for glue dye yeah. and when you plan of fixating using a suture a long arm proline suture preferably 9 nano proline is the ideal thing so you don't require anything else special and uh, sir i have certain points uh, which we can yeah. take up for discussion for the young surgeons to uh, catch uh, uh, though the talk is more focused on implantation techniques Uh, sometimes it may be necessary for a person to for a for a surgeon and a treatment surgeon to explant the lens and reimplant some some other lens so do you have any surgical tips on the explantation of an eye oil the explantation of lens suppose you want to expand the lens what i would suggest is uh, always fill up the anterior chamber 
with uh, with viscoat as well as uh, something like helon gv because or helon and to make sure the anterior chamber is very nicely inflated then uh, what i do is i try to bring uh, that lens uh, the the, uh, the the lens which is the original lens into uh, i try to uh, 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 get it out of the bag and if uh, sometimes if it's going to be a long time there can be fibrosis we can just cut the haptic and bring the optic alone what i do is i bring it into the anterior chamber and then i put the second eye oil okay i use the first eye oil as a scaffold because i don't want while removing the first eye oil i don't i, would, I don't want any rupture of the posterior capsule because if we rupture the posterior capsule the whole battle is lost so what i do is <clears throat> i keep that that uh, first eye oil in the anterior chamber making sure that i have a good a nice deep anterior chamber visco elastic is a game changer in my opinion and uh, something like ovd like helon or helon gv or even visco to protect the endothelium and then i put the second eye oil underneath the first eye oil into the bag and then uh, and then try to uh, uh, remove this lens either by cutting the lenses into two or cutting by almost three fourths and then extending the incision to about 3.2 mm or 3.4 mm i do what is called a hand on hand technique if you do and try to do a hand on hand technique you will be able to remove most of these lenses without extending the incision to 4 or 5 mm or 6 mm thank you so uh, uh, that's a wonderful suggestion so any because there's an eye oil implantation i i wish i had so because this is an eye oil implantation probably we have to have an eye oil explantation course also Uh, and uh, you know yeah. okay. yes do we have an explantation course no 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 okay okay so uh, that, i guess i should have covered that also in this no 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 problem so so that's 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 a, that that's the idea behind so yeah. uh, any form of foldable lenses silicon or uh, even uh, any form of acrylic lenses bisecting to do use enough uh, and liberal viscoelastics to protect the corneal endothelium Uh, remove it. some of the lenses could be folded and removed some of the lenses one quadrant if you remove we, we can just rotate and remove the rest of the lens so that is possible and as had been uh, mentioned very clearly if the iris is uh, uh, if the if the haptic is too much stuck you can just sacrifice the haptic within the bag that's a good suggestion too yes sir and and uh, uh, how do you manage uh, when eye oil is stuck halfway during injection Yes, so, uh, I, I had a video, but I didn't have time to show the video. If, if the wound assisted ones, if your wound, if the anterior chamber is not inflated sufficiently, and if you try to push it, and if you don't give proper force, then the the eye oil can get stuck in the wound, and it will neither go inside nor come outside. And you don't want that to come outside; you want it to go inside. If you try to push it, then the auto it will go, it may go inside with a jerk. and rupture the pc what i do is i go underneath the lens go posterior to the lens and try to extend the incision with a small keratome making sure that you don't don't damage the optic of the lens because the optic is probably there in that area so go underneath go posterior to the lens posterior to the the posterior lip of the incision you try to extend and then you can either pull the lens out or push it inside depending on whatever you want to do Uh, so that's that's a suggestion yeah yeah uh, so uh, that's a good suggestion don't try to push it yes. pull it don't try to push yeah. it they will damage or if you try to push it then you will go with the jerk inside and then you will rupture the, the iris puncture yes. the puncture the pc yeah. or so, you can so, even damage the iris produce bleeding yeah, yeah so many things can happen so many things can happen so the best thing is uh, especially when uh, someone is doing a wound assisted injection of uh, insertion of iv Uh, make sure the the tip of the cartridge is locked in the wound, and you does you don't release the uh, the the locking effect till the the entire eye oil is gone into the anterior chamber or into the eye. So that is one key thing. And if at all you have a stuck, uh, as I said, you can try to go posterior and make a widening, but use enough uh, visco elastics. so that uh, uh, it doesn't damage uh, intraocular structures so that is one another thing another thing is while you are doing the wound assisted 
always make sure that you inflate the anterior chamber as i told you and uh, give with the second instrument give traction to your side port give traction on the eye towards you while you are assisting so when you give traction on the eye there is a what you call the the force works both ways so you can push the lens same time you give traction on the eye slightly towards you with the second instrument and the lens goes in like a, a, a very smoothly without any problem exactly so it is like uh, give a traction from the wound and a counter traction from the uh, second side Absolutely. use your second hand uh, that's a good advice and i do follow that um, do you leave an igoil inside or exchange if there was an amputation of a haptic after having injected it of the haptic the haptic uh, injected the lens inside yes and accidentally you find that the, the one of the haptics is amputated you uh, leave the lens inside or uh, uh, you... I, can, i will never leave any any fractured lens inside so i will never you... leave i will never leave any fractured lens inside i uh, this lens has to come out yes i do agree also most of the surgeon will try to leave the lens inside and uh, that is a risk if you make a good optic capture if it stays in the center it's fine otherwise the patient would definitely have a decentration of eye wall and and a second procedure may be warranted so better that all such lenses be removed and also please and understand the medico legal implications okay if the patient goes to some other ophthalmologist and that ophthalmologist will say you that you got a cracked lens inside the eye okay he may not do it intentionally but you can tell that you have a lens which is cracked inside the eye the patient can go in for and the patient is obviously is going to have some problem and they they can they can sue you so medical legal implications are also there you can't have a crack even for that matter i have seen some patients having a mark in the center okay mark sometimes because accidentally the the the, the sister who loads the lens sometimes they catch the center of the optic okay there can be a mark in the center i try to wait for some time i see whether the mark is disappearing okay sometimes the mark may not disappear sometimes the mark can be little see i try to remove these lenses okay and put the lenses uh, because the lens the mark can be right in the center and it can be really, really really troublesome i had a patient who had a something like a mark in the center it was a alcon lens it is nothing to do with the lens but is the way with the the loading has to be done and the patient had lot of polyopia and uh, because of scatter of light and i have to explain the lens explain. Okay. yes how yes. do you, how do you, how do you manage uh, when there is a reverse implantation or a flip lens upside down uh, into the back so is there any tip for the viewers it is simple no no you very simple if the the, the the lens is upside down what you do is inject again good viscoelastic and try to take a second instrument and try to uh, 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 or you can use something like a two second instruments and use something like a bimanual technique and uh, try to uh, 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 what do you call reverse the um, the optic and try to put optic automatically the haptic also will turn on uh, on this side so don't leave these reverse lenses also like that it's also very important because especially in a multifocal you can't obviously do it because the multifocality will be completely lost yeah so you can't leave these lenses like that you have to reverse it it's very simple of reversing it or you can just use only one single hand go underneath the optic with a second instrument and try to uh, uh, what do you call jab it there and you no know, automatically it will tilt uh uh yeah, only thing is you need to make sure the anterior chamber and the bag is well inflated so uh use the bimanual uh, both the hands in uh, making the lens uh, in the right position yeah uh, i just have a suggestion sir if it is a non aspheric lens uh, a biconvex lens still do we need to revert it or leave it that yeah you can probably leave it like that at that time but Yeah. But still, a perfect surgery is something that uh, yes. small things make up perfection. So, yeah, it's not it's very difficult to not a difficult uh, call, uh, do a somer sort of the lens. It's very, it's not very uh, difficult as long as you keep the anterior chamber uh, very deep and uh, it's very easy. And use a bimanual technique is very easy. Uh, 
Uh, any tips to the end, uh, refractive surgeons on fakie diode implantations? Fakie diode implantation, I think the, the, the pre-operative tests are very important. The white to white diameter, how you are going to do it, whether you are going to do your op scan or rival master and uh, whatever you want, uh, very important. Sizing of the lens is very important. And uh, the uh, uh, all these pre-operative protocols, intra-operative protocols, making sure that you don't come into the center of the eye at all. One side port I make very close to the main port on the left side. The other side port on the right side, I make it down. So that is easier for me to tackle the, the leading one the, uh, underneath the iris. So these are seeing, making sure, because this you have to be always careful, always be aware that there is a There's normal no lens, lens underneath it. Yes. So you, you have a tendency to do that. If you go to the center of the eye, always work in the periphery. And preferably, I, I would suggest that you use something like Helon because it comes out very fast and uh, because it's quasi viscoelastic because HPMC takes a longer time to come out. Sometimes you can have retain very difficult, especially with the center hole, the HPMC, I'm sorry, the Helon. Uh, it comes Absolutely. out very nicely with the, all, all these uh, new uh, generation fakie So, uh, the, the, the most important thing is having got uh, crystalline lens, uh, there shouldn't be uh, an iatrogenic cataract formation just because of the surgery. So, that can need to be uh, given. Um, and from your lecture, sir, uh, you preferred uh, a screw type injector over push type uh, yes. because it gives you more control. It gives you a better control. And regarding the uh, presbyopia lenses, you preferred uh, uh, um, a symphony lens, an extended depth of focus lens over uh, trifocals or multifocals. Yes. Uh, could that be because of reduced post operative operations and uh, improved contrast uh, vision? Please understand this uh, <clears throat> the symphony lenses, in my opinion, uh, the halos are very, the photic phenomenon are very less. More importantly, the contrast vision is very good in symphony. That is why even if you don't get very good near vision, like the trifocals or the multifocals in symphony, the patients are happy because the range of vision is very good. And also the contrast vision, the quality of vision is excellent in symphony. So that is, I think, uh, the advantage of symphony, in my opinion. Nowadays, I do a combination of symphony in one eye and Technus 3.25 in the other eye. And uh, this works wonderfully well because the symphony gives that contrast, the range of vision, the Technus 3.25 gives a good near vision as well. And the patients are very particular about near vision. I do that as well. So the uh, symphony, I do the micro mono vision. If I do both eyes symphony, I do one eye plano, the other eye I aim for about 0 0.5, 0 0.75. The micro mono vision, make sure that the patient has got good range of vision. Intermediate vision is really fantastic in symphony. Near vision is what is lacking. So that's what I do with the micro monovision. I am able to do that as well. That's an excellent advice because I do do that. Uh, uh, I prefer uh, extended depth of focus lens, uh, especially because of the, um, uh, the quality of vision, what it gives. And uh, in the dominant eye, distant dominant eye, I would definitely go for that. And near dominant eye, maybe as you said, yes, a multifocal. Would help. Uh, there are no other questions sir, for discussion, and we also okay, sir. have moved. Uh, uh, we are just past uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, more of the yeah, time. yeah, yeah. I think so because I have to go for another webinar. Uh, yeah, to conclude, uh, to conclude though, I will uh, implantation techniques had greatly developed over years, and special injector cartridge systems are available in the market. The thorough knowledge and skills for budding surgeon are mandatory in fixation of IOL in the back and on the sulcus at times. And definitely a secondary fixation measures in the absence of uh, capsular support needs to be known by all anterior segment surgeons. I believe this video-based lecture and discussions have created a significant impact on all the viewers and especially the young budding surgeons to upgrade their knowledge and to enhance their skills in their practice. I especially thank our speaker and educator, Dr. Mohan Rajan, sir, and the team of JNJ Vision 
for organizing such a lively event. Thank you all and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, JNJ. Thank you, Raghu, Ashok, Jashwinder, and all the people from JNJ for the wonderful opportunity. See you again next Saturday. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye.